Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Building Matters, the webinar series hosted by the City of Richmond's Buildings Department. My name is Sefer Forishani. I'm a Building Energy Specialist with City of Richmond. It is my pleasure to welcome you all today to our webinar, where we have a distinguished speaker, uh, Benoit Lebeau, who is an international expert in energy efficiency. Benoit has been leading several international initiatives on energy efficiency and its relationship with decarbonization. He started his career at the Energy Efficiency Division of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California. He later on joined the French National Energy and Environmental Agency, after which he joined the International Energy Agency, where he was an advisor within the Energy Efficiency Policy Analysis Division. Later on, he joined the United Nations Development Program, where he worked on climate change mitigation projects in sub-Saharan Africa. Ben was probably most well known for his work with the International Partnership for Energy Efficient Cooperation, uh, where he was the executive director from 2009 until 2019. Uh, after which he joined the French Ministry for the Ecological and Inclusive Transition as a Senior Energy Efficiency Policy Advisor. Benoit is a civil engineer by training. He also has a Master's in Mechanical Engineering from UC Berkeley in the US. It is my pleasure to welcome Benoit to Building Matters. And with that, I hand it over to him for his presentation. Benoit, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Sepper, for the kind introduction. Thank you also. Uh, to you and your colleague Rob Bernhardt for the kind invitation. I'm always happy to share views on the import importance of energy efficiency. And um, indeed, I'm very happy to share the view that energy efficiency is a fuel and it is a very important fuel and must be considered as the first fuel. I will share uh, some general idea and uh, what uh, we do maybe in Europe on that front. We all know that our planet is a, a beautiful planet, a blue. We know less that the planet as we know it has not always been the same. And uh, 20,000 years ago, this is what the planet looked like. At the time, we were in an ice age. That was the last ice age. And you can see the snow cap from the Arctic and the Antarctic were much bigger. In fact, we had roughly over um, London or over New York, one kilometer of ice on the, as a cap. At the time, the oceans were below uh, current sea level by 120 meters. So it was a different planet Earth. And the difference between this planet where the ice cap was uh, in most of North Africa, most of Canada, and, and some part of Europe where the ocean were lower than 120 meters compared to today's sea level. What I want to highlight is that we only have five degrees Celsius less in that uh, uh, compared to the time of today. So um, when we look at Europe, so this is uh, the limit. You can see that you barely recognize Europe because of course, the coastline is very different with uh, uh, sea level lower than 120 meters. We have different. There is no British um, island because you can walk from the European mainland to the British island and you can see the ice cap covering most of Scandinavia. And uh, once again, the difference is, is five degrees Celsius. One degree Celsius is already a big step. Five degrees Celsius, it's a totally different world. This is a Bering Strait, you know that, you know, 15 years ago, ancestors, they walk from Asia to North America because the ice cap was uh, big, thick on the west part, a little bit less on the uh, west part of uh, uh, Canada. And once again, five degrees Celsius. So to understand where, where we are today, we need to understand what's above us. And above us, we have this. We have the equivalent of um, a bathtub that's being filled with some greenhouse gas emissions. So above our head, we have some greenhouse gas emission. This is what we emit. And it goes, this emission, into the atmosphere. And this is a thin layer of what we call the greenhouse gas emission. And we have a, a, a concentration. 
And um, we have some carbon sinks and sequestration. This is a biomass and the ocean, you know, capturing CO2 and using photosynthesis to uh, transform CO2 into uh, biomass. So until 20, until 20, uh, 1750, until we start digging the ground to extract coal, there was a perfect stability between the incoming greenhouse gas emission and the outgoing greenhouse gas emission through carbon six and sequestration. And like in a bathtub, there was a perfect balance and there was a, the concentration, the thickness of the greenhouse gas around planet Earth was very stable and maintained the average temperature of planet Earth at 15 degrees C. What we have observed is that with the fast development of uh, human society and the, the use of fossil fuel, coal first, then oil, then gas, then another series of uh, greenhouse gas such as methane and uh, nitrous oxide and some, some gases like the fluorescent gases that were not even used a century ago, we are pouring in the atmosphere more and more gases than we can extract. And at the same time, we cut the forest because of urbanization. So the level of carbon sinks and sequestration is reducing. As a consequence, the level in the bathtub and in the atmosphere, the thickness of the greenhouse gas layer is expanding. And we have reached a level that is totally unheard now of uh, 450, for 410 ppm parts per million of this layer. And we have already gained one degree Celsius compared to uh, the very long, stable uh, climate that we had since the uh, Ice Age. Anyway, we know that we don't only have one tap filling this tub of greenhouse gas concentration, but we have as uh, many taps as we have countries. We have as many taps as we have individuals and as we have gases. And we know that um, if we want to avoid a climate disaster, we absolutely have to avoid the increase of temperature be above two degrees Celsius. That means that we know exactly the amount of carbon that we can emit in the atmosphere. We have a budget, we have a carbon budget for the coming um, century, and we know that we should not go beyond 450 ppm. And looking at the equation, this is what we mean, 40 gigatons, and we have only 16 giga gigatons. So we have to equate this. So anyway, we have no choice but to decarbonize this world, and we know exactly the facts. But now let's face a reality. This is a very convenient, very familiar energy system that we use almost daily, a car. A car emits greenhouse gas emission. And when we pay attention to uh, such an energy system, there are only four ways through which greenhouse gas emissions are being emitted. The first way is through the manufacturing of the car. It takes some uh, greenhouse gas emission to build the uh, uh, metal sheet and aluminum and copper and, and glasses to build the car. And there is some greenhouse gas emission. Then come the fuel, uh, fuel. Depending on the choice of fuel, we will use to drive this car some energy that will more or less ex uh, produce, generate some greenhouse gas emission. Then comes the performance of the car. Depending of the fuel we have, the car can consume some energy or less energy. This is energy efficiency. And there is a fourth part. The behavior change, the way we use the car, the way we drive the car, to choose the car instead of uh, walking or riding the back or taking public transport. So there is this economic uh, behavior change that we have. So to understand greenhouse gas emission for every energy system that we use, we always have one or two or three or four of these blocks. 
greenhouse gas emissions are being spread because of the material we use, the energy we use to manage and to fuel the energy system, but you have also the energy performance of the system itself, and we have the choice also, and the behavior change. You may have the most energy efficient cars, but if you use them three times more, you are not going to have the, the, the gains. So I like these four steps and uh, how it has illustrated. This is a, a car, and you, call, you can go on the website, it's called a Gazelle, and this is a car of the future because this is an ultra, ultra light vehicles. This car has no steel, no aluminum. It's made fully of composite material for both the body and the chassis. As a result, the main characteristic of this car is weight. This is a less than 700 kilogram car. And because of the very small weight, you can drive it with electricity, hydrogen, gas, or fuel. You will consume much, much less, a minimum 50% less. But once again, you see building uh, um, material of the car, performance, and here the car is uh, the most important part of the car is the weight. I don't know if you know this guy. This is me next to Bertrand Picard. Bertrand Picard is a wonderful man who has done this. He has built this solar plane. You may have heard about solar impulse. Bertrand Picard and his team have demonstrated that he could circle the world with the sun as the only fuel for this plane. But when we look close to uh, what makes this plane flight, in fact, this, this plane was able to fly not so much because of the uh, solar panel, but because of every detail that was spent to design this plane. First, the choice of material, light weighted material, then the performance of every technical solution, the super energy efficient fan, propellers, but also the very uh, advanced way of managing the power production and the battery storage, and then the behavior of the plane. The, uh, Bertrand Bicard could have developed a plane that uh, was, this plane flight at a speed of 140 kilometers per hour, 140 kilometers per hour. The plane, he could have designed a plane that could fly twice more, but with eight time more photovoltaics. So when you ask uh, Bertrand Picard to build this plane, how much, how long did it take to your engineers to, be, to design this plane? Well, it, it took two smart PV engineers a full day to design the, so, the solar part, but to design the rest of the plane the choice of material, the design, the selection of every aspect, every prospect. He took a team of 12, uh, 20 eng engineers during 12 years. So the visible part of the plane is the solar aspect, but what made this plane took off was the energy performance, the energy efficiency of the plane. This is not a solar plane. This is the plane of the future. This is a energy efficient plane. So it's a less visible part, but key to uh, demonstrate that even today we can fly a plane with a man, with a pilot, with the sun as the only fuel. And above all, what's interesting here is to note that uh, it was impossible until they did it. You are all familiar with the building, so this is just one illustration of the application of what I just tried to explain, that there are four steps to decarbonize. This is, of course, a passive solar uh, building. It's a building where uh, 20 uh, engineers are working every day. They are specialists in energy. And here you have the best example of uh, choice of material, local material. This 
a very efficient building is made out of straw, wood, and clay. Only half of the rooftop is covered with PV, and this is a three-story building hosting 20 engineers working full-time. This building has no air conditioning, no space seating, and it is located in the French Alps, and it does very well, and it produces seven times more electricity per year than it consumes, because in this building you combine material, choice of clean energy efficiency, optimize energy efficiency, and the right behavior also of the people uh, living it. And the beauty of this building is that when you take upfront all the consideration, the cost was not so high. This is maybe the uh, cheapest building built in that region during that year that was five years ago. So this is just a, an illustration. You know that by heart the, that we can build today some uh, building like this one. I know that there is a case of many passive house and many passive design in British Columbia. But it is also important that when you push the curse of efficiency and behavior change, you can go really low. And you know what? This is exactly what the world needs today. You have heard about the Paris Agreement. We have to move the uh, world on the low carbon path. But the trend today is upwards. We, despite all what we know about climate change, despite all what we know about the solution, we still continue every year to emit more and more in the world. We need to move the whole economy on the low carbon path. And as I just explained, there are four steps. Change practice and behavior. The way we use energy, the way we feel, the way we design energy system, the way we think energy. First step. Then comes lowering the energy needs and through energy efficiency. And there is a long list of possibilities that energy efficiency offers. Then come renewable energy. And we see that it, we need a combination of all this to bring the world on the low carbon path. And then improve carbon sinks, typically stop deforestation, plant trees, but also pay attention to the carbon content of material that we use. And as you know, in buildings, we use a lot of material from concrete to wood, from clay to straw, and, 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 and so on. So anyway, those are the flow. Uh, I've been showing this for uh, many, uh, many years. And in the last IPCC report, I was so pleased to see the IPCC colleagues summarize that the four steps of climate, any climate change mitigation is more efficient use of energy, greater use of low carbon or no carbon energy, improve carbon sinks, and lifestyle and behavior change. You need the four combined somehow, always to decarbonize the world. You may have seen this type of graphic, in fact, separate uh, show uh, uh, some illustration. Of this is coming from the IEA. This is an assessment of the possibility to bring the world greenhouse gas emission from the energy sector to uh, a more sustainable pathway. And as you can see, the portion of energy efficiency in terms of greenhouse gas pollution is greater than renewable energy. But we need the two. We need renewable energy. We need to go green. But we, uh, in quantity, we have to. Uh, we can obtain more greenhouse gas emissions from efficiency first. And you can see going nuclear carbon capture and storage of fuel switching in this analysis of the IA is much less than what renewable energy combined with energy efficiency can bring. This is also coming from the IPCC. It shows that all sectors of the economy from energy supply, transport, building, industry, agriculture, forestry, and waste, we all have a potential to, for greenhouse gas reduction, but building is where we have the biggest portion of the greenhouse gas emission. So we have really a big, uh, possibility to uh, encourage uh, uh, a low carbon building. When a country has underground some oil and gas, on, some investment can be made and you can drill the oil and for the next 20, 30 years, you will produce energy. When the country decides to go for renewable energy, 
there's some investment, there's some assessment of the potential, there's some investment, and over the next 20, 25, 30 years, energy will get delivered. When a country decides for a project, a program, or a policy to promote energy efficiency, for example, in buildings, energy efficiency will get delivered for the next 20, 30 years. It's a fuel. Energy efficiency is a fuel. It needs the same time of attention. You need to assess it. You need to build the capacity. You need to drive the investment. And you need to deliver. But it does deliver the same way uh, 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 um, all extraction, gas extraction of photovoltaic investment. This is a nice assessment and made by the International Energy Agency. Not that this is made by the French uh, National Agency. This is uh, energy savings in uh, 15 in European countries. And as you can see, the total energy consumed by these uh, European countries um, is fairly flat or even going uh, lower from coal, oil, gas, nuclear and renewable energy. But those countries have studied to implement energy efficiency, you know, after the first oil crisis in the 70s. And when we take into account and when we assess the energy that they could have consumed without energy efficiency, you see the portion in green here. The hypothetical energy use had there no been no energy efficiency improvement. And as you can see in green here, when energy efficiency is delivered, the amount is superior to any of the other fuel. Not only energy efficiency is a fuel, it can be the first fuel. And in countries where energy efficiency have been implemented, has been implemented in full, energy efficiency is the first fuel. And we have similar cases. I'm sure that in Canada, you are certainly a similar figure. And in the US, you have exactly the same type of assessment. The beauty of energy efficiency is not only to lower greenhouse gas emission. The beauty of energy efficiency is listed here. There are many multiple benefits of energy efficiency. The IEA, the International Energy Agency, has a, they published a report in 2014 listing 15 different multiple benefits of energy efficiency. Of course, energy savings, greenhouse gas emission, enhanced energy security, energy delivery, energy price, better control of price, macroeconomic impacts, industrial productivity, poverty alleviation, health and well-being, employment, local air pollution, resource management, public budget, disposable income, asset value. Energy efficiency has multiple benefits. We used to focus, we have a tendency to only focus on the strict economic benefits of the energy savings. When we take into account some of the multiple benefits, improved quality, job creation, health benefits, we can multiply by two, three, four, the economic value of energy efficiency. But in today's world, with a fast changing climate, I believe energy efficiency should be considered as a safety belt for the built environment. Because we know that this world we face extreme weather condition, heat wave in summertime, but also cold wave. And there's a big difference when you are part of the building that is well designed with all the solution that we know that energy efficiency brings. And there's a big difference when you go through this type of extreme uh, uh, climate events. So um, really energy efficiency and all what comes in the built environment is really a safety belt to our to ourselves and to our communities. Well, you all heard about what happened in Texas, you know, and uh, there was even in Europe lots of coverage of the uh, uh, drama in Texas. And um, lessons for Europe, it's very clear, you know, Texas ranked number nine, 29 among the, in the US states in energy efficiency, aggressive building energy standards and cost a, and efficient electric system can reduce uh, the energy demand and the, make easier for the users to uh, uh, 
to survive in, in, in this type of uh, con condition. I was very pleased with this uh, uh, great picture from uh, Sepper's introduction that you uh, are also thinking that uh, energy efficiency has to be part of, of the solution, of course. We tend to forget in this world that everything, everyone does, every day and everywhere requires energy. There is not a single moment in our modern life where we don't consume some form of energy. It's so embedded. Energy is a lifeblood in economic development. It's a lifeblood in our daily life, in our daily activity. But we tend to forget that and we even take for granted electricity. We tend to believe that electricity is just there. There is a switch and here is a light. We forgot that even electricity has to be produced. And it's so embedded in our daily life that uh, we, we, we don't see, we, it's still magic. Well, there is, as you know, some uh, consequence in uh, creating the infrastructure and providing electricity. Green electricity is needed to decarbonize the economy. This is absolutely true. We need green electricity. But green electricity has some environmental impact for the landscape, for the production. Um, in France, we electricity was born through the hydro system, and we have an aging hydro system. We have some dams, and I was reading not so long ago, a few weeks back, in fact, that uh, the da dams are aging, they are still producing 15% uh, of uh, France electricity and they are aging and <laughs> we don't know yet how we're going to maintain the dams in uh, a safe condition. So, uh, you know, there is some impact and we tend to forget that uh, even the cleanest like uh, hydro has some impact. And needless to say that also for wind and solar and biomass and geothermal, green electricity has some also impact. We tend to forget that electricity is only 25% of the world energy. There's a lot of conversion and depending of the country, we forgot that electricity is a very visible part of the energy we use daily, but it's only a portion and we need to decarbonize energy. And we need to know, we know exactly how to decarbonize electricity. That's clear. We know less how to decarbonize the, the other part of the energy system all the heat that we consume, all the fossil fuel that we consume to, for space heating and all the, for mobility and transport and so on. And this is where we have to be careful that we need electricity in urban transport, in industrial process, in hydrogen production, and of course in space heating. So it's um, energy, Electricity is also good for um, for uh, any energy uh, electrical use, and we need to reduce energy and including electricity whenever it, it is possible through efficient technique, typically heat pump. But we first, before installing heat pump, we have to lower the amount of uh, space ceiling that we and we know how to do it. Because we need this electricity, we need to have more electricity in more energy use. This is an energy balance in a country like France. And you can see on the, on the right that uh, at the beginning, in green, you have electricity, you see. And in yellow, uh, in the pink, you have uh, nuclear power. And there is some transformation and we produce energy efficiency for the use and the use is heating, electricity and mobility. Those are the three uses that we have. We know that it is possible to bring the whole system to meet the Paris Agreement by improving energy efficiency, but we have to accept to switch typically some of the fossil fuel that we use from uh, uh, from some uh, fossil fuel to electricity. And, and as you can see, the size of the arrows here depend, is, uh, correspond to the, to the physical uh, 
uh, size of the uh, energy being consumed and produced. And this is where you see that electricity is needed everywhere at all level. And uh, we can manage that, manage uh, um, a fully decarbonized system only uh, only if we combine smart energy use through energy efficiency with, of course, clean energy all over. I want to conclude with uh, some message here. Energy efficiency is complex because energy efficiency is difficult. It's everywhere. It's everyone's business. Energy efficiency is a result of investment, design, thinking, technology, and behavior change. So energy efficiency, I consider that energy efficiency is part of the knowledge economy. And it's a world, we have two types of resources in this world. We have the finite resources, we have the infinite resources. Finite resources, fossil energy, minerals, land, sand, those are finite resources. The, the law, of finite resources, the more we share, the less we have. The more we share fossil fuel material, the less we have. In finite resources, renewable energy, but also knowledge, love, friendship, and energy efficiency. And the law here is, the more we share, the more the resource grow. When I share my knowledge with you all, I don't lose my knowledge. I gain, and we all gain. When we share love, when we share friendship, the more we share, the more it grows. The same for energy efficiency. The more we learn, the more we share, the more it develops. Except that on the finite resources, the law is immediate. The more we share, the less we have. This is immediate. To share the infinite resources, it takes time. Sharing takes time. And this is not a small understanding for energy efficiency. I've learned that energy efficiency needs a long time horizon to deliver. We need to put in place the capacities. We need to put in place instruments. We need to put in place the institution. And only energy efficiency gets delivered. I only wish that sometimes energy efficiency be treated really like any other fuel like nuclear power, like renewable energy, like any other investment that you put in place a human capacity, the institution, the all the knowledge, and then you do the investment. This is all sometimes what we are missing for energy efficiency. We know that energy, energy efficiency can bring any initial annual energy spendings to a lower level in terms of uh, energy bill. We know that we have to accept sometimes there's some investment, and this investment in energy efficiency can be annualized. But the benefits of energy efficiency is that you will lower the total cost of running the system. What we tend to uh, is this part, that there's a cost for de delivering energy efficiency program and policy. And this is often, often misunderstood. I'm happy to share that with you because I believe that we can deliver an efficiency, but it has to be, can become a first fuel, but it has to be fuel first also. In France, we had a wonderful event that lasted the last uh, year and a half. It's called the French Citizen Climate Convention. President Macron took 150 citizens, selected randomly in the population, they were brought together for a full year of thinking. And they had a goal, how France can reduce its greenhouse gas reduction by 40% between now and 2030, 10 years to reduce by 40%. And those citizens had no knowledge, no understanding of climate change and what greenhouse gas emissions are and so on. But they had access to knowledge. They were given the possibility to call specialists, Nobel Prizes, whoever they wanted to, to learn. And then they start developing their own sense. And you know what they found? They found that energy efficiency is the first fuel. And they have requested go the government um, to uh, put energy efficiency at the very top of any uh, of the uh, greenhouse gas uh, 
uh, mitigation strategy. And there's a, a very important debate in France. There's a new law coming uh, that has been inspired by this uh, French Citizen Climate Convention. In short, energy efficiency in six Ds. Energy efficiency, by definition, is the decoupling, decoupling of the heat we need vis-à-vis -vis the, energy, the energy that we need to burn. Decoupling, this is the definition of energy efficiency. Decarbonization, this is a truth all over the world now, and we know very well the direction. Full decarbonization of the world is what we need to see. Decentralization, decentralization of the energy system, making sure that we make use of every resource that we can tap from the sun, from the from the from from the, from the ocean, from the water, from the wind. And also we need to decentralize the decision for energy efficiency and bringing as you do in Richmond, in British Columbia, energy efficiency at the municipal level, this is a very important trend to be encouraged and much more is needed. It's there's a, sometimes a lack of articulation between national policy and local implementation, more of that. Digitalization is a blessing for energy efficiency. First, to access the information, to set the baseline, to develop the metrics, to understand, to share the information, to train. Digitalization can also help the very fine control of the energy system around us. We have to be disruptive. The plane I showed, the car I showed, the uh, super passive building I showed. How um, definitely they are disruptive, but there is no other choice now. We have to also think in this step. And the last D is very important. We have to love what we do. We have to love this planet. We have to make this change desirable, to change from sustainable development goal to sustainable and desirable development goals in this world. Conclusion. I hope I make clear that energy efficiency is a fuel, should be considered as a fuel, should be treated by policy, by policymaker as a fuel. But energy efficiency needs to be fuel itself. It's not a free lunch. Energy efficiency only gets better deliver when it is fully understood, when you have some specific institutions, specific tools, specific metrics. And, and there is this notion that if you underinvest in the ingredients of energy and energy and won't get delivered and i also believe that some international collaboration can accelerate the sharing and deployment of good practices all over the world so i'm happy to uh, have the opportunity to to share with you those views uh, thank you for your kind attention and um, maybe we can engage some uh, nice conversation if you if you want